Well, y'all, I believe, and I actually know that we are in revival. Did y'all know that? That we are in revival? Did you know that even all the revivals in the past, they didn't even recognize it until after it was over or they were smack dab, like way in the middle of it. They didn't recognize it when it started. But we're already in revival and it started with the church. God revived the church in America. It took him about three years to do it, the last three years, but he revived even our church. He brought us out of casual, fruitless Christianity and back into power and authority. And that same revival is now spreading out into the city because now that we've been revived, we can use our power and authority to go out and revive a city. I don't know if you realize this, but you can't do much reviving whenever you're caught up in casual Christianity and you don't know your authority and the power that God's given you, you can't accomplish much. And that's what our upcoming revival is all about. We're going into the city to destroy the works of darkness. We're gonna come out of this building and go into the city and destroy the works of darkness. We're gonna go through the gates of hell and free the captives. Those who are demon possessed are gonna be set free in this revival. Those who are sick are gonna be healed in this revival. And those who are lost will be saved in this revival. This revival is for our city. And I fully expect us to pack out this room of 400 plus people every night. And it's April 18th through 20th. It's a Thursday night, a Friday night, and a Saturday night at the Owasso Tulsa Tech Center, just down the street from here. Now, our city needs you to clear your schedule for these nights because this is an appointed time for our city. I can't do this by myself. I really can't do this by myself. I need all of you to position your hearts with an attitude to serve our city and even with an attitude of excellence. Like, let's do this well because this is our opportunity to represent the goodness of God by serving our city. So if you already have something scheduled, try to move it. This is the first time I've ever asked y'all to do this at church. If you have something scheduled, try to move it. Like try to move this to the top of the priority list because this is an all hands on deck event. It's like a catalyst event. This This is ordained by God because revival is already here. We are just making room for it. April 18th through 20th, 2024, I believe we're gonna look back on these dates and just be amazed. Look at what God did through our obedience. We simply said, yes, he's gonna bless the city of Owasso through the work of our hands. How many of you believe it? Now, I'm gonna have a sign-up sheet for you all soon because we're gonna need like a prayer team and ushers and parking lot and greeters and security and cleanup and, and setup. up. Doesn't, doesn't all that sound like fun? I mean, that's all fun stuff, isn't it? This is gonna be work, but it's gonna be the, some of the most fulfilling work that you've ever done. So join me, let's just pray over this revival and declare God's word over this revival. Lord, we release our faith right now that this isn't just gonna be a casual event, but this is gonna be an event filled with your power and filled with your authority. Those who are demon possessed will be set free in this revival. Those who are sick will be healed in this revival. Those who are lost will be saved in this revival. And even those who think they are saved, but are believing some sort of counterfeit Christianity, they will be awakened in the name of Jesus through this revival. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, my, my message today is titled Hundredfold Return. Hundredfold Return. And yes, I'm going to talk about money. Yeehaw. So I tell you that ahead of time. So you can just put down your defenses and we'll just learn how to see money the way that God sees it. Because really that's the goal. God, I just want to see money the way that you see it. So we're going to start in Luke chapter eight, and I'm going to read verses four through 15. This is a very familiar parable that you've probably heard before, but I challenge you to just listen in like it's the first time you've ever heard it. So Luke chapter eight, verse four. One day Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. A farmer went out to plant his seed. As he scattered it across his field, some seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among rocks. It began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns and grew up with it, that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. And still other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. And when he said this, he called out, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. And he replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God. But I use parables to teach the others so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they look, they won't really see. And when they hear, they won't understand. But go ahead and look at somebody next to you and say, you are permitted to know the secrets. Isn't that wonderful? You are permitted to know the secrets to the kingdom of God. That's good news. Verse 11, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seeds that fell in the footpath represent those who hear the message, only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. 
The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they, become, they believe for a while, and then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represents those who hear the message, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. Who wants to produce a huge harvest? How many of you heard this parable used to teach about financial giving? Sowing seed. Raise your hand if you've heard it that way. It, well, this parable, Jesus is teaching about sowing the word of God, right, and reaping a harvest. So is it a misuse of scripture to apply the same principle to financial giving? I love the looks like, are you asking me a trick question? <laughs> it's not a misuse at all. How do we know this? Because even the apostle Paul used this parable to teach about financial giving. I want you to take a look at this. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Now, the enemy is so intent on us living in poverty, he'll have you read a scripture like this and be like, well, that, didn't even, that wasn't even talking about money. That was talking about giving your gifts and your talents and your time. But if you go read this in context, it is talking about financial giving because this whole section of scripture is when the apostle Paul goes out to collect an offering for the poor people that are in Jerusalem. And this is how he teaches them how to give. And even in the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul teaches that whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So sowing and reaping is a spiritual law that has been established by God, and it's been around since the foundation of the world. It applies to sowing a seed in a garden. It, it applies to giving finances. It applies to how you treat people. Have you ever noticed that? How you treat people, and you get exactly how you treated them. That's wonderful, isn't it? It applies to any action you take in life. Whatever you sow, that shall you also reap. Do you have a problem sowing a tomato seed and reaping a harvest of beautiful tomatoes to eat? No, but you didn't even create the seed. You people, what are you, selfish? You didn't create this. You didn't cause it to grow. You simply put it in the ground and you didn't even make the dirt. The dirt was already there for you. Oh, you simply put it in the ground and watched over it. And then you think that you can just pick off the tomatoes and eat them? Man, you do think this. None of us have a problem with a tiny seed that produces a harvest that's really too great to count. We're just like, wow, look at all these tomatoes. I'm gonna eat them and all the extras I'm gonna give away. And that's why this is called a hundredfold return. From seed to harvest is an unfathomable calculation. And I know the NLT, the New Living Translation said 100 times, but what we're really talking about is a hundredfold. Do you guys know the difference between 100 times and 100 fold? 100 fold is when it doubles every time you fold it. So we're really talking about your seed to the hundredth power. For example, if you take the number two to the hundredth power, here's what you get. Dun, 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 dun. Can anybody say this number right here? We'll see. Mason wrote it down for me. One, is that ro no, I got it, I got it. Mason's gonna come tell us what this number is. He, he, I don't think he heard the rest of my sermon after first service because he got so tied up on how you actually say this number. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if you can get it right. Yeah, sorry. I, I did hear the rest of the service. <laughs> but I also know my handwriting is garbage. So as soon as it's like, oh, yeah, that's why you told me to say this the first time. All right. One nonillion, 267 octillion, 650 septillion, 600 sextillion, 228 quintillion, 229 quadrillion, <laughs> 401 trillion, 496 billion, 703 million, 205,376. Thank you, Mason. And Mason, all you did was plant two seeds to get that. All of that. Amazing. It's really incomprehensible to the human mind how this little seed can go on and produce a big plant that produces a massive amount of fruit. And then get this, there are more seeds within the, within the fruit. And then it just goes again and it goes again and it just, 
Wow. Again, we don't have a problem with this. As a matter of fact, we expect it to happen. If I plant a seed, a tomato seed, that seed best become a tomato plant that gives me tomatoes or I'm going to be upset that it did not fulfill God's design, right? Any gardeners in the room that you're like, yes, that better work. But most of us, when we sow financial seed, we have a little bit of a problem expecting that hundredfold return on our little bitty seed. We think, oh, I shouldn't get that much. I didn't work for it. Why would God give me such a big return for this little amount that I invested into the kingdom? Or maybe you think, well, it didn't work last time, so it probably doesn't work at all. It's thoughts like these that prevent our seed from producing a massive harvest that it's designed to produce. Our wrong thinking kills the seed or it kills the plant before it ever produces fruit. And it doesn't have to be that way because Jesus gives us the answer. Aren't you thankful? Did you know that money is the number one thing that Jesus talked about in the gospels? He talked about money more than he talked about prayer because he knew we'd have a problem with it. So it doesn't have to be, Jesus teaches us how to care for our seed. Let's read that again, this time in the King James Version. This is Luke chapter eight, verse 15. He said, but on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. So according to this verse, three things are required to see your seed produce fruit. Number one, you gotta have a right motivation, right? Honest and pure heart. Number two, continue to believe. You gotta keep it. And number three, wait on the harvest. We gotta have patience in more areas than one, don't we? So I bet you can easily identify where you missed it. Maybe your motivation is off. Maybe you gave reluctantly or in response to pressure. Anybody ever done that? Maybe you gave to get the praise of others. Woo, look at what I gave, everybody. Maybe you uh, gave up on the harvest because it didn't come in your timing. You sowed a seed on Sunday because you needed a harvest on Monday. Anybody ever done that? Uh, yeah, I've been there. And then you abandon your seed because it doesn't show up on Monday. You're like, well, that didn't work. <laughs> there was no patience there. So just identify where your problem is so you can fix it because it's vital that you do because we are all called, every single person in this church is called to demonstrate the kingdom of God where there is always more than enough, more than enough. The church should contain the wealthiest people on the earth. It really should. Our resources should be so vast that we don't have a problem caring for the widows and the orphans. We should be the ones who are caring for the poor in our city, not the government. And that's why this whole thing is messed up because the government is not anointed for the job, the church is. But the reason the church hasn't been doing it is because we don't have the resources to do it because we've been caught up over here in poverty thinking. And so the devil took our job and now he's just using it to try to control all the people who are struggling to get by. How about the church rises up and does what it's supposed to do? We should also be possessing the best land in the city and building things that glorify God and demonstrate the magnificence of his kingdom. And I'm not just talking about church buildings. I'm talking about business buildings, the whole thing. That should all be owned by the church, by the people in the church. Let me put it to you that way, lest we get confused. I'm not saying the church has to own everything. And it's not that we create this harvest from our own efforts. We get messed up in that too. That's not the thing. No, we simply plant the seed, watch over it, and patiently wait as God creates the harvest. He does the, the harvest. Did that help anybody? Because it sure helped me. I didn't realize I had a problem expecting a massive harvest until just a few months ago. Isn't it amazing how we can be so blind to our own shortcomings, so to speak? I've taught about money a lot. I've been learning to see money God's ways and I, I had some things figured out and then I didn't have some things figured out. So when I was reading this scripture that we read today, a few months ago, the Holy Spirit interrupted me with a question. And he said, you don't have a problem expecting a massive harvest from a natural seed. Why do you have a problem expecting the same from your financial seed? I was like, well, how dare you point that out my shortcoming? For me, it was a problem because I didn't feel like I deserved a massive harvest. I wanted to be able to say, I worked for that. I earned that. But the reality is that's prideful thinking. Oh, man. <laughs> don't you just love it when you're in pride and don't know it, which is like every time you're in pride, right? Until either the Holy Spirit points it out or somebody else does. And it never feels good when it gets pointed out, but you sure are glad to get rid of it. Amen. So I renewed my thinking, I updated my expectations. So now when I sow financial seed, I expect it to produce a hundredfold return. My seed is required to fulfill God's design and produce a harvest. It's required. 
You know what I'm going to use that return for? That big old number that Mason just told us about? I'm going to use that return to advance the kingdom of God. And I'm also going to continue to just believe and wait patiently in my, as my financial harvest grows into maturity. I've accessed part of it, but I haven't accessed the whole thing. Some of it's still growing. So who's with me in this? You're going to expect your seed to produce a hundredfold return. Amen. So a few months ago, our church sowed a financial seed into a ministry in Argentina. As a church, we gave them $35,000 to fund a new building that they needed. It, it built the whole thing. And that seed is required to produce a hundredfold return. It's required. It was sown with the right motivation, and we are expectantly waiting God to multiply that seed into the building that we need as we grow. A few weeks after we sowed the $35,000 seed, I received an email from our Mexico missionary. They had been waiting for land to become available next to their church. And after many years of waiting, it finally became available. Only one problem, it was, it was 220,000 pesos, which is equivalent to $13,500. I don't think I've ever been more excited to get an email, especially when somebody was asking me to give, right? I was so excited about this email. I leapt out of my chair and I praised God for this amazing opportunity to sow seed. I'm like, this timing is perfect. We're looking for land. Our land costs millions of dollars. We don't have millions of dollars, but we do have $13,500. We're gonna sow a seed. And this is how the kingdom of God works. When you need something, God gives you an opportunity to sow that same type of seed into somebody else. And to me, this opportunity to sow seed that came at the perfect moment is more miraculous than the harvest that we will receive because of that seed sown. I mean, just the timing was miraculous. I couldn't get them the money fast enough. I'm like, here, you gotta have this. I, I had to make sure that nobody else took that opportunity to sow seed. I'm like, if I don't do it today, some other church is gonna come and try. I'm gonna sow this seed. I was so excited. So together as a church, we sowed that financial seed by giving $13,500 to buy land in Mexico. They're gonna close on the land next week. It's exciting, yeah. So now you guys are gonna get to see with your own two eyes how these two seeds turn into a harvest more than enough to buy the land that we need and to build the church that we need to continue growing, amen. Speaking of, allow me to update you on the journey of this new church building. Anybody want an update? It's been, it's been a few, what is going on with this place? I'm going to start from the beginning because some people haven't heard all the details. So this past December, the Holy Spirit led me to that new Fifth Avenue business park on the west side of the highway, just south of 76th Street North. And as I was searching it out, the vision for our next building started to unfold. We're going to create a space where Owasso gathers. God has commissioned us to restore mentorship in our city where the old teach the young and the young teach the old. You see, we are anointed, and I truly believe this, our church is anointed to bridge generational gaps. And not only that, but we are anointed to bridge denominational gaps. We're here to bring people back together. And to achieve this, our new space will not feel like a commercial building. It will feel like home. It'll be so welcoming that people say, man, I just can't wait to get back to no limits. We will have a living room and a dining room that'll hold about 20 people each. And this is where friends and family can gather without the pressure of HGTV. Right? I mean, how many of us, like, you don't invite people over? Because my home doesn't quite look like HDTV, and I don't want people to know. If you've been in Owasso for long, you also know that we really need a coffee shop with more gathering space, right? There's a lot of coffee shops here. They all have, like, five seats. You're like, I don't know if I'll get a seat there, so I don't know if I want to meet there. We're going to solve that problem. The No Limits Coffee Shop will be open to the community daily. It'll become the favorite spot for business meetings. It really will. It'll be where one-on-one -on -one mentorship takes place. Let's go meet and get coffee. And it'll be a great spot for date night and community events as well. And Amy, I really think of you whenever I think community events. I can see you like hosting a bingo night there and you know, things like that that just bring people together. And I know you're anointed for that job. You, you're great at bringing people together. Our new auditorium will be three times this size. It'll seat about 300 people. But I truly believe it won't take long to fill that up. Once you make space, people will come and it will be filled up. Um, but when that happens, we'll just turn that room into like a dining hall and then build a bigger auditorium. The vision unfolded as I pursued renting that space at Fifth Avenue Business Park. But throughout the negotiations with them, I began to notice warning signs. Warning signs were coming up as I was going through the process. I even had a dream that was a warning sign. I was like, oh man. Um, then the Holy Spirit just told me to stop. Stop pursuing this. Okay. You know, when you live life by the Spirit, these kind of things happen. The Holy Spirit leads you in a direction and you plan the outcome. Only for him to lead you to another outcome. 
Anybody ever been there? <laughs> Clearly the Holy Spirit used Fifth Avenue to awaken me to the vision, awaken me to the vision. I believe there was also a divine connection with the owner of that building that we're gonna recognize later or we're gonna understand later. But the story doesn't end there. The journey's still unfolding. Not many weeks ago, our evangelist here, Evangelist Tim, was texting me about properties available in Owasso. And then we went to look at them. And the first one was interesting, but it wasn't big enough. It was about between three and four acres. Uh, to give you perspective, our parking lot for 300 people will take up two acres. So, I mean, that's just, that was just not enough room. And then the second one we went to was like, like, I don't want to get ahead of myself on this one, but I can just tell you that I left there with like this huge smile and printed on my face, like a big confident smile. It's like, ooh, I love this place and I couldn't get rid of it. Um, here's where it is. It's located right off the highway near 106th Street North. You know, like it's where there's Jim Glover and then there's the bowling alley and then urgent care and then there's this land and it's 10 acres that are available there. So here's a video of me driving up to the land so you can get an idea of what it looks like. Currently it's mostly overgrown. I love trees though, it just needs to be cleaned up a little bit. And then there's this 10,000 square foot building that you see right there. Um, it's basically an open barn, it needs new metal siding and uh, the inside would have to be completely finished out. There's no insulation, no nothing on the inside. But just having a foundation and a steel frame of a building saves about $400,000 in construction costs. So doesn't that make you just thankful that at least something exists on the land? And for those of you who, have a, who are having kind of a hard time of seeing what this could be, maybe you're not quite a visionary, you're, you have my permission to just cringe and watch the process unfold, right? You, you can just do that. But for those of you who are visionaries, you already see what this could become like. You're already dreaming. There was a guy in our first service, he's, he's in his 80s. His name's Bruce, we call him Coach. And he's saying, Kate, I drove by that land yesterday and then you ruined my nap. Because Bruce is a visionary. So he saw this land and then he started dreaming about what could be, right? And he couldn't get his mind off of it. Um, when I was editing this video that you're watching right now, I noticed a song that came on in my car while I was driving in. Like it just started as I was pulling in and I didn't even realize it in the moment, like what was going on. I didn't realize it until I edited this video yesterday, how perfect this song was and what was being declared over the land as I drove in through this song. So I want to play just the first verse of this for you. This is uh, We Need a Miracle by Charity Gale. Just listen to the lyrics of this because it's, it's incredible. You are the miracle maker, God of the impossible. There is no power greater, exceeding, abundant, beyond what we could ask or think. We just call on your name, Jesus. Get this done in the name of Jesus. And we just get to be a part of the process and watch God work. It's amazing. All right, this next image up here is just a preliminary floor plan just to kind of give you some substance on what this building could turn into. So this is the building that you saw. Um, in the middle here would be a, the auditorium, which would seat 330 people. On the right side is like storage, video studio, offices, nursery. Over there on the left top is the living room and then the dining room. And then we got like our kitchen bathrooms and stuff with the coffee shop all right there on the left. And of course, this is just like the beginning. This is how we would use those first 10,000 square feet. And then we could just expand from there because when you got 10 acres, you got room to grow. Amen. 
So another church meets here on Sunday evenings. Did you guys know that? It's called G6 Church. We've been subleasing this building to them for like three years now. We kind of helped them get off the ground. They were a church plant and they're, and they're still here with us, which is awesome. They get to use our sound equipment and all that. It just makes it real easy for them to get their church going. And a few weeks ago, our service went way longer than it normally would. I mean, y'all kept me here way too long. And because of that, I ran into a guy that was coming from that church to prepare for their service. And now fast forward two weeks, Tim and I were going to meet the realtor at this property to see the inside of the building. And the realtor gets out of his truck and I realize it's the same guy that I just met two weeks ago by running into him here. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? These types of things are not coincidental. Some people just say, ah, it's just coincidence. It is not coincidental. God orchestrates the right connections when we need them. And we should just like revel in what God does in our lives in these moments. It's just amazing. How amazing is it that the realtor for this property is already familiar with No Limits? He's actually here in this building every Sunday night already. <laughs> I mean, that's just incredible. So we've been working on the right offer to present to the owner of this land. This is kind of like a retirement plan for the owner. He, he is the owner of one of the pool companies in Tulsa. He bought this in 1998 with hopes of building like a big uh, showroom type thing for his pool company. That never came into fruition. Now he's retirement age and he's just kind of looking to, to offload it and get into his retirement. So we've been working on that offer. We got the, the details ironed out. And the realtor is submitting that offer to the owner. Apparently the owner is a little bit hard to get a hold of. He's a busy guy. So um, we're just waiting on that connection to happen. So that's where we are in the process and I'll keep you updated. Now, whether it's this land or not, a harvest is coming from the seeds that we've planted. I know that for sure. God will be glorified by confirming his word with signs following. So I encourage you to get in on the heavenly principle of sowing and reaping. You should take every opportunity that comes your way to sow financial seed, every opportunity to sow. If we truly believe the word of God, why would we hesitate to sow seed? Well, let's see, I could store this away in a savings account and watch it rot, like the word says that it's going to, <laughs> or I could sow it and experience the joy of harvest. So let me remind you of what happens when you give generously. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 9, God will then get generously provide all you need, and then you will always have everything you need. Somebody say everything. How much will you have? Everything you need. And what? Plenty left over to share with others. That's the life I want to live. As a matter of fact, that's the life I do live right now. And so now I, I'm really addicted to a generous life. You know, there's nothing more fun to do with money than to be generous with it. And God continues to expand and multiply me as I go. Did you know that finances in the kingdom of God are a free flow, a rushing river, an endless supply? endless supply. There's, there's no need to store it up because there's always more to come. So just tap into the joy of the free flow. And don't forget those three requirements that Jesus taught us in regards to sowing and reaping. Did you know that you have a part to play? Did you know that all the promises of God, you have a part to play? And you know, Beth and I were talking about this uh, last night, actually, and I want to pull up what we wrote down because we're like, so does that mean that we have to, that we're earning God's promises because we have a part to play in these promises? So we were just talking it through, like, what does this actually mean? So the, what I wrote down is the promises of God require us to follow his instruction. This instruction is not to earn the promise, but to access the promise. There are specific instructions for accessing the promise. It's just like a recipe. It tells you exactly what to do. But if you don't do it, you don't get the right result. Or it's just like a map. If you don't follow the instructions, you don't get where you need to go. So it's like God has given us this, this uh, book of cheat sheets, right? Here's how you get there. Here's how you access the promises in the kingdom of God. I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. And if you'll just do it this way, it'll actually work. So that's what this is. So here's the three requirements for getting a harvest from your seed. You got to have the right motivation. You got to continue to believe. And you got to wait on the harvest. Patience. That's it. Isn't that easy? At least he didn't give us like a 21-step process, right? Three steps. That's all it takes. And I'm in no way pressuring you to give today. We just read that God loves a cheerful giver. So I can tell you this, if you're not cheerful about it, you might as well not give. And I mean that 100%. If you're not cheerful about it, just don't even bother. My goal today is to help you connect your mind with the truth that already exists in your spirit. Did you know that your spirit already knows about this hundredfold return? 
your spirit's just been patiently waiting on your mind to catch up and, <laughs> and to do it. So may today be the day that your thoughts become fully aligned with the word of God in this area. May you walk out of here seeing money the way that God sees it. That is the goal. We wanna see money the way that God sees it. So instead of using your mind to worry about money, I know none of us in here have never done that. Instead of using your mind to worry about money, use it to imagine what life will be like when this harvest is flowing into your life. More than enough, right? Endless supply. Hilarious generosity. I mean, our generosity should just make people laugh at how generous we are and what we're able to accomplish. So I want you to close your eyes just for a minute here. I want you to engage your imagination. What would you do tomorrow if this free flow was already operating in your life? How would your life look different tomorrow? What would it be like going into work, knowing that there's a free flow of finances and no pressure? What kind of generosity would you in, engage in? Like, is there somebody that you would buy a house? Would you buy your mom a house? Would you, would you buy a car for somebody? Would you go to the store and just start buying groceries for everybody who's coming through the line? Like, what would you be doing with this free flow? And I believe it's important that we use our imagination for this, that instead of using our minds to worry, that we use our imaginations how God wants us to be, because this is where we're headed. So take every opportunity to sow seed and never hesitate to expect your harvest. Don't feel bad for expecting a harvest. Make sure your motivation is right. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, all that stuff. But yes, give expecting a harvest. A harvest. Amen. Just like you expect tomato seeds to grow tomatoes, you should expect your financial seeds to grow your finances because that's what God wants to do. So Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to sow seed and reap a harvest. It works either way, whether it be for the positive or negative. Whatever we sow, that shall we also reap. So we just want to engage in sowing good things. So we sow good financial seed and we reap a good financial harvest. We sow good, uh, we, we just want to sow a bunch of goodness out there in our city. And Lord, I thank you that you've released us from that nonsense that keeps us from expecting the harvest. Lord, we know that you get great joy when we come to you expecting your word to be true. And we do expect your word to be true. Your word says it, so I believe it. Your word says it, so I believe it. I'm not gonna look at my experiences in the past and what happened with my money five years ago, 10 years ago, or even yesterday. That's not what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned with what your word says. Your word says it, I believe it. In Jesus' name, amen.